Welcome, Zoomers. <laughs> I am sorry. We have had a glorious 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the party. Um, we're talking from Isaiah 61. We're speaking specifically of Jesus. It, it says that he would give us beauty for ashes. And we have been discussing the reality that all the way through the Old Testament, you find people who are clothing themselves in sackcloth and ashes from the fire and then covering themselves with dust. And many times when the sackcloth was not available, they would tear their clothes. And they used it as they faced death and specifically the death of, of an important person or a loved one or someone within their circle. And all the mourners at the funeral would, would be dressed in that fashion. It, it was the way to say, I am beyond miserable. I, I am in the pits because they were facing the reality of their own mortality, their own death. And, and it connected them back to Adam Adam as a human being, it says, from the dust. He was formed out of the dust of the earth. And then when he sinned, that was the um, word that was put over him. He, he would die, and in dying, he would die, which means there would be many deaths on the way to death. And in that, it, it says, from dust you came, and to dust you go. And so that's where it comes from. Now when they face death, uh, they, they might be living their life thinking that they really would never die. But as they now face death, they are faced with the fact that they are in process of dying. They're already in the middle of many deaths. And so the horror of their mentality, uh, their, their mortality that I am, facing my insignificance. I, I'm a passing creature uh, that, um, like, like a mosquito has but a few hours to live. Well, I can only expand on that, but then I'm gone and my, my name will be forgotten. I, I have no innate worth and pour on the dust. I'm a dying person. I'm a person that has no eternal significance. That's, that's what they were saying. Um, my life then suddenly becomes meaningless. I mean, everything I'm doing is going to end in death. It's as if as I drive my life that uh, I'm all full of excitement at my ambitions and what I shall do, and I hear a cackle in the back seat, and death leans over my shoulder and says, forget it, I'll get you before you get there. And we suddenly come down that, um, we, we are mortal and we're passing. And, and when these people faced that and faced their own weakness and, and fragility, I say again, they put ashes in their hair, they covered themselves in dust and they said, oh, wretched man that I am. And either wore sackcloth or rent their, their clothes. And, and, and so um, it became at that moment sort of their present identity. Uh, this this is who they are, um, and um, and so they are. They're saying at this moment, this, this is how I identify myself as. I'm a dying person. I'm an insignificant person. It, it's where another expression would be putting "woe is me." That belongs to the sackcloth and ashes. Um, and, and I say they were obsessed with it. They were professional mourners. Um, you know, I've heard these. You don't want to hear them twice. Um, go to Africa, you'll hear it. And in the near Middle East today, um, the professional mourners, they're going to make a real thing out of this. Today, in America, it would, it would be a very big business. Um, but the professional mourners, they knew how to wail. Very, very good. They trained to wail. They, they were trained to be miserable. 
they, they were trained to link arms with you in your sackcloth and ashes and let's make a real day of this. And, and so when you, you had death, then you called in the professional mourners and they would just mingle with your, your party. I mean, your, it's a pity party, that's what it was. And I, I don't want to mock persons in their grief, but that's what was happening. And, and so this, I say, was really part of the Israeli con con culture in those days. Um, but it, it spilled over. And at other times, I called it a moment ago, mini deaths. Um, you, you would understand me. We would use the term death when we're speaking of a dream or a destiny or a hope. I mean, we, we speak of the death of a dream. Um, you can have loss, loss of your home. Uh, when the tornadoes and hurricanes sweep through the south here um, in, in literally five minutes, you can have the death uh, of your entire uh, material life. It's gone. A and the floods carry it away in the hurricanes and so on. Um, we use the word death there, the death of our future, the, the death of all our hopes and with it is that sense of standing alone in the loss of a business and people are facing that right now this very day in terms of the um, results of the, of the virus a loss of business um, betrayal when my friend betrays me that rips my guts out and something died there we use that expression Something died. It, it was as if the bottom fell out. Divorce, bankruptcy, all those, they, they, they bring about, and we would use the term death, and the people we're talking about would use it as an opportunity for ashes in your hair, and dust, and that, that would be a time for mourning and announcing their utter misery. It would be, and this would be hard to put into words, I'm going to say it um, and, and realize it, there's more to it, but I, I would say when they mourned the loss of the one they perceived to be God, um, how can I put it? We, we've seen, I don't know if you have seen, but in the last few weeks there has been a fleeting news headlines of um, Christian uh, singers uh, up in Canada, I believe, who, who said publicly as they no longer believe in God. And I, I, I would so love to connect with that guy because I don't believe he has stopped believing in God. He stopped believing in the wretched monster that many people call God. And I applaud him for that. And I stopped believing in that God a long time ago. Um, but that's actually, uh, that's not an aside. That's what I'm trying to say here. Israel would come to a point where their concept of God was horrific. It was totally unlike God. And, and, and they are mourning before that God because they don't know where they stand with him. And... Uh, you, you will read that they came before God with, with sackcloth and ashes because it's a time of mourning. They're, they're, they're mourning their own futile efforts to try and please this God. They, they, they are mourning the fact they can never be good enough. And, and so all they can do is, woe is me, I'm worthless to you. I, I'm unworthy, I'm no good, you know, have mercy upon me. Trouble is, much religion today haven't discovered the New Testament yet. And they are still using those words to describe their relationship, not to the real God, but to the God they've invented, the God of, they've lost. But it goes with this. Have you, have you realized that there is a tremendous amount of sadness that goes with religion? Um, I come away from a meeting with the sense of, I'm no good. Um, at the end of a sermon, I'm supposed to feel so utterly miserable 
that I will just cry, oh God, have mercy on me. And then they say they've had a successful service. Uh, it, it's, well, that's in the Old Testament, all over the place. And you will find, I say again, that they brought out their sackcloth and ashes. It's when religious people are burned out, they do not, burned out, yeah, with ashes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that they don't know where to turn. And, and um, that is usually linked when death and destruction are threatening. That is, it's not here yet, but the enemy forces are approaching and the hope of my being alive in the future is pretty slim. And it looks like they're coming to wipe us out or a plague is coming and um, so on and so on. And that's when they would suddenly realize the God they worship, they don't know where they stand with him. And, and so they've got to scream at him, beg him, plead him, cajole him, prod him, make do something. And, and we'll try and convince him that we're worth his doing something by groveling. Let's throw on the dust and the ashes and tell God, I know we're no good. I know that we're as good as dead, but have mercy on us. And you will read that plenty in the Old Testament. They, they are groveling, and that's the big word with religion. It's the big word with this sackcloth and ashes. We're merely mortal. We're fragile. We're unimportant. We're insignificant. I don't know why you're listening to me at all, oh God. So I'm so guilty, and I'm so ashamed. Self-loathing is looked upon almost as holiness by religion that, um, well, unworthy. Um, and so the ashes of death, wherever you find it, whether at the end of what we call life or all these scattered events, I realize I live in a world of ashes. And ashes, when, that, when that's where I live, it, it produces death because I'm obsessed with death and death becomes my breath. And so death becomes an outlet. And so our daily news um, cycles are filled with death, 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 death. Everybody's killing everybody. It's death because it comes from the ashes. Um, it, it produces then hatred, hatred. A and then the hatred turns and blames. And then there's revenge and there's destruction. That's all the ashes. And all we can do is throw you know, ashes in our head. Dear God, what a world we live in. But, but that produces a response. And the world only knows how to respond. How with more death and revenge and more hatred and blame, destruction. That that's the world of, and and, and it, it happens on a micro level, a macro level. It, it happens nationally and it happens in our families. The way it is, it's ashes. And at any level, at any level. All ashes can do is produce complain. I, I'm moaning about the life that I'm living because it's got all these ashes mixed in with it, living in a world of death. And of course, omnipresent fear, fear on every hand. Okay, spent enough time there. <laughs> yeah, you see, although it fills the old, well, not. But it's all over the place in the Old Testament. God never initiated sackcloth and ashes. There's never a command to throw ashes in your hair, dust on your person and rip your clothes. And all of that, everything I've just been saying was not initiated by God. It was a human response to the way they perceived what was going on, whether it was about their own mortality or about the loss of a loved one, the loss of a business or a home or whatever, and the way they understood 
their groveling position before a God that was an invention of their own mind. That was quite a statement. Um, once I come to meet with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, <clears throat> or as the New Testament said, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, meaning not the God of your imagination, the God you think he should be like, but the God who is revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm not talking about any other God, the one that I meet in Jesus. That's what he's saying. And, and that God, from the beginning, Old Testament, that true, real God is set with all his being against groveling. And I, that, we, we've made it a religious act, but he is totally, he's set with his being against the wailing of unworthy and I'm no good and, and grovel, oh God have mercy, that, no, I don't meet with that God in the face of Jesus Christ. In fact, he said the real God in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, he says, stand up. As fact, we could, I've got to bite my tongue. We could go a long way on this. But in Deuteronomy, and, and you'll have to read the whole book to find the verses, but there's more than one in Deuteronomy um, where he says that he delivered them out of slavery, which is groveling, delivered you from slavery, that you might stand erect. Oh, I like that. He says, I delivered you so that you might stand up straight. And, and but then to, uh, and the one um, that was brought, we were talking, was it Thursday, and Andrew brought it up, that Ezekiel, I mean, we're deep in the Old Testament there, and Ezekiel was on his face. And, and the Lord says, stand up that I might speak to you. Well, in religion, I thought he spoke to you when you were flat on your face in the dark. No, oh, he says, I'm not going to speak to you down there. You stand up and we come on that expression that is not apparent in the translation of our Bibles, but um, with, it's usually translated with, it means face to face. Do, do you understand? God says, I don't want you down there groveling. Stand up. Let's be face to face, eye to eye. Let, let me look into your eyes and you know that I love you. And then let's talk. That's Old Testament. In the New Testament, then it overspills. He never came. Okay, do you remember in, in the parable of the um, lost son, the younger brother who goes into the far country and is obviously the bad boy, the wild card of, of that parable. When he comes home and Jesus is saying, this is what the father's really like. The, in that parable, Jesus is introducing us to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, so, so this kid comes home. By Jewish custom that I've been talking about, sackcloth and ashes would be a jolly good idea. Um, I'd stop on the way home, kid, and get some, and um, let, let's do this properly, come groveling to your father. But he almost does. No, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But as you remember the parable, the father will have absolutely nothing of it. Cuts him off in, in that conversation, and instead grabs him, kisses him all over. The margin of your Bible says repeatedly, kissing all over. And, and, and then he says, you are my son. And then says, go get the best robe, which means party robe, and put it on him. And let's go to the party. Put shoes on his feet and a ring on his finger. Um, a minute, this doesn't sound like sackcloth and ashes. This is the total reverse. This is a party. Party. 
And then, now listen carefully, the elder brother, who is the obvious religious guy in the parable, is enraged. He will not come into the party. Now, in the light of everything I said this morning, why not? Why not? Because the younger brother was not in sackcloth and ashes. He said uh, that the kid should be groveling. The kid should be talking worthlessness, insignificance. But no, he's not. You, you, you've exalted him. You have made him worthy of a feast. Yeah, that's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now we carry this text from Isaiah 61 into the mouth of Jesus on that day in Nazareth when he said that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, quoting Isaiah. And he said, ah, I have come. It's me it's talking about. I've come to give you beauty for ashes. So then the input of the true God God the Father, and now his Son, who to have seen the Son is to see the Father. He is God from God. So the voice of God says, I don't want you with ashes. I don't want you in that mode. I want you instead to have beauty instead of ashes. I want to make a great exchange. I have come in humanity. I've taken to myself. Yes, I've taken to yourself dust and ashes. I've come where you are in order to take your ashes and to give you instead beauty. Look at it. So what is beauty? Well, in the scripture, beauty is many times paralleled as glory. The glory of God is the beauty of God. If you read right through the Old Testament, um, the beauty of God, the glory of God, the glory of God, as we've, we've said before, is his love. Deep inside the word glory is the idea of opinion, the, the opinion of God about you. What, what is it? Well, you see, the sackcloth and ashes said his opinion. He thinks we're dirt. He thinks we're nothing. We're insignificant. So we've got to cry, oh God, change your mind about us. So cry and wish and have mercy. God says, I'm going to give you beauty. That is, my opinion of you is not that. That's the God, if you can call him that, that monster that Adam invented in his broken mind. The real God says, get up off your feet. Stop all that whining and wailing. I want to give you beauty. And what is beauty? You would be clothed in my opinion of you. Which is, I, I loved you before you existed. You exist because I loved you. I, my love brought you into being. And, and as my beloved, that is where life begins. And, and you were created for God himself to dwell inside of you and that you should live with him and participate in his life. That, that's, that's the very first hint of the grace of God in the Bible. That you, you were created, yes, you were created out of God. If that's, if that's it, we, we, you know, we burn you and what's left, I, I the chemicals or the minerals that are left after we would have burned you. I could go to the you know, pharmacy or somewhere. I could buy all those minerals. I, I could buy you for under twenty dollars. Is it really? Yeah, you want to say dust, right? Yeah, we're dust and ashes. Yeah, burn it is. It is. I mean, they were they were right, but they'd forgotten one thing. They were created from dust but they were created to be dust containing the glory of God. So I suppose that turns dust into gold dust. It's, you know, that they were meant to walk erect. They were meant to stand in awe, though made out of dust. 
that they had become one with, united with, the God who is love. And, and so, even when they sinned, yes, indeed, dust to dust, that is, that is they, they brought that about. They introduced death into the, the race. But God, the real God, never left them. He, he never pursued them in life, saying, you dust, you dust, you dust. Rather, he says, I, you will never, not on my watch, God says, my love will never let you perish. I know you've done this dark thing. You, you, I mean, sin is insanity. But, but I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to pursue you into the new world you've created of death, dust, and ashes. I'm coming after you. You're not going to get away with this. You're not going to perish. You're not going to descend back into the nothingness in which I called you for. I'm coming for. I'm in the most beautiful way. I'm coming to get you. It's, or as David said in Psalm 23, his love, his kindness, loving kindness, pursues me. Surely goodness and mercy. I know your Bible says follow, but that word everywhere else in the Old Testament is pursuing. And, and, and so his love and goodness pursues us. You just, you say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm sinned and separated from God. That's your idea. I don't want to believe it. But as far as God is concerned, he's breathing down your neck. He's not left you. He pursues you. He will not let his beloved go. He's coming after you. Now, that's love. That's love. Um, he will never let us descend in, into the, the depths of the nothing of the ashes that proclaim you were once, but you are no more. No, he comes. And so infinite beauty, the beauty uh, of God's love, the, 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 the in limitless beauty. You know, the word beauty, what, what is beauty? You know it when you see it. Uh, beauty is, is complete. There, there's no jagged edges. There's a finishedness about it. So you, you're no longer something in progress. There's no more scaffolding. It's done. It's finished. It is. And it's whole. And, and when you see beauty, there's a radiance about it, whichever form of beauty we're looking at. With, with the artist, the, the way in which every color moves into another color. There's no harshness. There's no feeling, oh, that doesn't belong there. No, it, everything belongs to the point where you're not even aware of how it happens. You just know it all belongs together. And it's all so beautiful. And, and the artist um, knew when the last stroke of the brush was done. If that stroke hadn't been made, it would not be complete. And if one more stroke is made, it will not be complete now. But it's perfect. That's beauty. It's radiance. And the love of God is the beauty of God. It's interesting. Um, if you were to go, I believe this has been done. This is not original to me. Uh, if you would go to persons who say they want nothing to do with God and then give them the paper and say, now write down what kind of God would you think God should be? And they write down exactly the God that Jesus came to show. They write down the God of love and say, now if God was like that, I'd... well, that's the way he is. That is the real God. You're in the world of dust and ashes to a God who hates the sight of you. But no, this, this is the true God. It's beautiful. And even the world says it's beautiful. And we are called now to come back to our original destiny, original plan of participating in that beauty. But love has many facets. Would that be it? Like strokes of a brush on a painting or facets of the beauty? Um, whatever. Love has many facets. And they're laid out in 1 Corinthians 13. 
we'll have to spend a couple of weeks on it. But um, when we say God is love, most people leave out 1 Corinthians 13. But the fact is, the word that is used there is God love. It, it's love is. And that word love in the Greek language is agape, which is the unique love that I've just been talking about, God's love. And with some of these beautiful scriptures, we, you know, we, we, we use them all in the right, wrong places. So you go to a wedding and people read 1 Corinthians 13, love is. <clears throat> and I say that, yeah, hopefully, that's right. But we've missed the point. There's many levels to 1 Corinthians 13, and the first level is 1 Corinthians 13 is what God is like. That's why we say he's beauty. Why? Well, let me introduce you to the God you know is beautiful, but maybe has never broken it down. God love, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is fully revealed in Jesus, is patient. That is, he never gives up. Uh, uh, that's stunning because we've been raised to think he's getting mad with me he's getting irritated I can almost hear him saying when will you get this but he doesn't he's patient you blew it again you tripped over your feet again and what does he do he picks you up doesn't matter Patience. He's absolutely convinced that in the end, the work he's begun in you will come to completion. And he's got patience that is as long as the ages of ages. Love is kind. Kind. That word actually means useful. It means the person who, without making any fuss about it, is just doing exactly what you need at this moment. Kindness. You, it's, it's love, busy about looking after you. It, it's, it's love, helping the elderly person across the street. Yeah, that is kind. Because you came out of nowhere, they don't know your name, but you helped them across the street, and they, you were so useful at that moment. It's kindness. Um, love is kind. It doesn't brag. See, oh boy, this gets me into trouble. But, but the God of religion is a boastful, narcissistic bragger. Um, all the, you've got to grovel and say he's great. And all the time he says, stand up. Let's, let's talk. Let's love each other. Um, no, love doesn't brag. It is not arrogant. It's not rude. He's never rude. In fact, he is so gentle, it sometimes it's embarrassing that he comes and is so kind and so gentle. You know, you, you fail, you fall. Yes, we do. We, do. We, we don't be who we know we are. So what does he do? He doesn't kick us and say, for goodness sake, get up. No, he comes and sits beside us and says, we, we'll be on our way whenever you're ready. We... we you know, you go into many churches and you backslid. Well, have you ever thought of the fact he backslid with you? Because he, he's, I mean, the sheep, the sheep in the parable, I guess you could say backslid. I mean, it was a sheep, but it ended up in the wilderness. So what does the shepherd do? Just spit in the wilderness, a stupid sheep. No, he joins the sheep in its backsliding. He sits with the sheep in the wilderness. And he's not coming out until he's got it around his neck properly and everything's fine. And he's patient, he's kind, he's gentle. He's un un unbelievably not rude. Doesn't seek his own. <laughs> he's not provoked. You know what that means? Y you can't upset him. He's not provoked. I was raised to believe you could 
buying ice cream on Sunday and getting upset. I mean, honestly, I'm not exaggerating. The God I was raised with was continually irritated with me. I mean, I guess he created me to piss him off. I mean, it's the idea that he loves me and I can't provoke him. But it, that, that's what it says here. God's love is not easily... Pro oh, but the next one. I, I don't know what to do with this one. <laughs> he doesn't take into account a wrong. Or another translation, keeps no record of wrongs. No, you can't say that. That would destroy religion. Religion is based on the fact that God never forgets everything wrong you've done. It's based on it. Religion says, get the ashes out. Tear your garments. Wail, for God remembers every wicked thing you've done. So he doesn't remember any of it. You say, but he had to torture Jesus and murder his own son so he could forgive you. I don't know. Huh. Well, just a minute. Long before Jesus came back in the Old Testament, he said, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sins from you. That was long before Jesus came. It's the nature of God to forgive you. And in fact, I don't like the word forgive. I'm sorry, it's one thing, you know, you should be used to me by now. Uh, there's a lot of words I don't like. Well, so if, I, if I said that I forgive Sherry, the implication is I was mad with Sherry. But now I've forgiven her means I'm not mad with you anymore. That's the English word forgive. Huh. God doesn't forgive them because he was never mad with us. Is that too much to take? That God was never mad with us? He doesn't keep a record of wrongs? No, and the word in the Greek language is for forgive, is really to release you. And so you're released from any idea of guilt you had. You're released from all the shame that you've carried around. You've released from having an identity of sackcloth and ashes. You're released by the beauty of God to participate in that beauty. That's what it is. Doesn't take into account a wrong supper. And so on and so on. Now that, so you stand back from a painting and you know that that's beauty. Well, now stand back. And look at this God, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And this is who they are. This is the Father. You can trust him. He doesn't have that, you know, I'm going to get you one day when Jesus gets out of the way. No, um, the Father is the fountain of this love. Jesus is the fullest expression of this love inside our humanity. Yeah. And so Jesus is the Son of God, that is God from God. And he comes, he is love seeking us. And how John begins the Word, which is another way of saying Jesus, the Son of God. The Word became flesh. Now, it doesn't say he became human, which, which he did. And that's certainly said elsewhere. But why did he say flesh? Because flesh is a bad word. If you go into the New Testament, the word flesh speaks of my brokenness, my, my ashes. Uh, flesh means my, my position is dust. I'm, I'm, I'm falling apart. I'm, I've forgotten who I am. I'm standing on, on, on the brink of death, fragile and so on and so on, flesh. He became flesh. I mean, can it sink in that God joined us in the ash heap that the human race had become? 
And in so doing, he declared that our ashes, our lives reduced to ashes without even knowing who we were. But our ashes are of such significance. They are of such infinite worth that he loves us in our ashes. And he said, I'm coming in to get you. As the shepherd went into the wilderness to get the sheep, the woman went into the dirt of the floor to get the coin. And the father ran down the road to embrace and kiss the son. God says, you're not getting away with this. You're not going to perish. I'm coming in to get you. Because you may be covered in ashes and you may see yourself as an ash heap. But I say you are of such worth. You are worth an exchange. You take my beauty. I'll, I'll take your ashes. You have value that is beyond expression. And John says, we beheld his glory. That is, we saw that in the dust of our flesh, God had come to be with us. This is the original plan. Jesus is laying out before us the original plan. He is God inside our dust. And when he came, it wasn't to be living a life up there, floating in the ether, far above us and beyond us, and say, look what I can do. It was to come and say, this is who you were created to be. I have come to show you what a human really is. God inside. Huh. You see, sin so blinded us, the great lie that infused the human race so blinded us that all we saw was the dust. And we were blind to the fact that God dwells in the dust. And now Jesus comes to show us, look, this is what it's all about. And then this beauty for ashes, the exchange. We don't have time to go into the details, but you realize the entire life of Jesus, really, the incarnation, God joining us is where it begins. And it's the whole of his life, but especially when it comes to the cross. What, what's happening? This. Try, try, and, try and forget everything you've heard about the cross of Jesus. Because it's, it's been turned into what I mentioned a moment ago, that that in order to find any kind of forgiveness for you, God had to torture and murder his own son. And so they, they say that the sufferings of Jesus was the father torturing his son. Well, would you, could you, I mean, if you really want to, you can go back to that afterwards. But just for the next 10 minutes, could you, could you forget that? Something else was happening there, not that. Actually, you see, because the Son of God is one with the Father and one with the Spirit, we call Holy Trinity, which incidentally today is Trinity Sunday. Um, and one together, that cannot be broken. We don't have three gods. We have one God. So the Father is not God without the Son. The Son is not God without the Father. The Spirit isn't God without the Father and Son. You can't break that. So when Jesus joined us inside our human flesh, so we could see him, Father and Spirit came with him. Did you understand? It wasn't that Jesus left the Trinity and there's an empty seat there now, and Father says he'll be back in 30 years. You go, <coughs> He didn't leave the Trinity. He brought the Trinity with him. What do you think he was doing when he got up early in the morning and goes to the hills? Except that he's celebrating and relishing uh, the, the relationship he has with the Father in the Holy Spirit. 
And so when Jesus goes to the cross, the Father is there holding him, not torturing him, holding him as his son. And where's the Spirit? The Spirit is enabling him to go through with this. The Trinity loves you. And the Trinity entered into the anguish of our ashes in order to give us beauty. And that's what happens. What? At the cross? If, I, if I'm going to, what happened at the cross? I'm not going to ask some quasi theologian in the 1500s. What would he know? I'm going to ask Peter. He was there. What about John? He was there. What did they say? They said, speaking to the temple, the high priest, speaking to the people in the temple, you crucified him. And then he says, by the hands of wicked men, he was crucified. God the Father didn't beat up Jesus. Wicked men. The temple, religion, Roman forces, the whole world system. They got together, amazingly. But they could agree on that one thing, crucify it. Every lash of the whip was not the father. It was wicked men. And what does he do with what they put on him? It says he answered them never a word. Which meant, I take it. I take it. That would be a first, and maybe an only, in the history of crucifixion. Or any torture. When they were crucified, and they crucified people by the hundreds, Romans did. When they crucified them, inevitably, the, the words that were spoken to the man who is having nails put through him and lashes and so on, his response always was to curse them. The, the, in their dying breath, they're bringing down the curses of the gods they worshipped upon them. And they were saying, you'll be damned in hell for what you're doing to me. And now the only person who could carry through on a threat says not a word. Meaning, I'm not rejecting what you're doing. I'm taking what you're doing. This is what ashes do. This is when you only see yourself as dust and ashes. You do this kind of thing. You kill, you burn, you destroy. Well, I'm taking it. I am taking it out of you. Give it to me. I'm taking it. Or as Peter said, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When they beat him, he didn't threaten them. He just received it. So that by his bruise that they gave him, we might be healed. He says, give me your ashes. Give me the best your death ashes can do. Give it to me. And they gave it to him, and his body became the depository of our sin, and all the grief and the sorrow, the sackcloth, the ashes. He took it to himself. And then he himself, opened his arms and received death. So they actually, they didn't get to murder him. It says he gave up his spirit. He said, I'm going in, which means I am now going into death itself, carrying with me all the sin and reviling and what they put upon me. I take it, love takes it, his re only words he said to them was, Father, forgive them, or Father, release them. They know not what they do. They, they think they're dust and ashes. They don't know who they are. And he says, I'm going into the deepest darkness. I'm going into the deepest blindness that has come upon this human race. I'm going where you are. And right inside the blindness, carrying you all to death with me, I am going to reveal that God loves you. 
what you've never heard in that darkness. You've never dreamt of in that darkness. It's never entered into your imagination. But I am coming right into that. And you are going to know my love. And I'm going to embrace you. And I'm carrying you out of here in my life. So God came into my ashes, took them, and said, now I give to you my beauty, and in that we're out of here. And they call it resurrection. And what is resurrection? Because it's not resuscitation. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, persons die and then they come back to life. No, it's not that. Resurrection means that <laughs> but death died. That's the only way you can say it. it. It means that death died, but not only died, but everything death had done is rolled back to be as if it never was. And so Jesus said, and this has got to be one of my favorite texts. Oh, it's a good one. It's no matter what we've been talking about. Revelation 1.17. This is John. John the apostle. He says, when I saw him, he sees Jesus. And of course, Revelation is a long time after Jesus rose from the dead. But now he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as one like a dead man. Because the, the glory, the majesty, the wonder of looking upon Jesus even took John by surprise. And he, and he falls down on his face. But then, listen to this. And he placed his right hand on me. And... Um, it was Andrew again, right, who, who pointed out that if, if, if you fall down here and I put my right hand on you, it meant I had to kneel down beside you to do that. It meant that Jesus in the, now we can see him is God, still in his human body, but we see him fully as God by Revelation 1. And that God, that God, goes all the way down to where John had fallen and lays his hands upon him and says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. He said, I am what this whole thing is about. I'm the first introduction. I'm the last conclusion. I am the living one. And a better understanding of that would be, I am livingness. I am the one out of whom all life proceeds. That is, I didn't only conquer death. I am the source of life. And he said, this is my, this is my favorite verse, I think, I think, for now, in the whole New Testament. He says, I was dead. Uh, who do you know that can say, I was dead? It's fantastic. The was, I mean, is fantastic. I was dead. He's actually joined us dust to dust, ashes to ashes, from dust you came to dust you go, and Jesus said, I'm going in there. And I'm going to go right there where you, you, you had this obsession, this magnetic draw to the fact that I'm dying, I'm dead, ashes and dust. I am going there. I was dead. But when I got dead, I revealed myself as the source of all life. And that killed death. Death couldn't stand in the presence of life. And you discovered God's beauty right in the middle of your ashes. I was dead. Behold, God. Focus your eyes on this. I am alive forevermore. And, and that makes sense in English. The Greek is unto the ages of ages of ages, but forevermore, good enough. But then, then have you heard this? Go on. We can't go with this. I've just got to report it to you. I mean, he said enough here, surely, in one sentence. But he ends it up by saying, and 
I have the keys of death. If you've got the keys to the house, you own the jolly place. I mean, you, you, I mean, do you, do you understand? I go to, to your house. I don't have the key, so I, I'm sort of just visiting here. But if I reach in my pocket and pull out the key and open the door, it means I've got ownership here. I've got authority here. He says he owns death. Meaning death is no longer what it was in the Old Testament. When I see people wailing in hopelessness, especially when they do it inside a church functional you know, ceremony, I want to stand up and say, you know, time out, time out. Um, has anybody heard of Jesus? You know, yeah. Uh, have you heard Jesus? Have you ever heard of a New Testament? Because everything you're doing is Old Testament. Jesus has come and he says, I have the keys of death, which means death now is not what it was. Your mortality is not what it was. Death is now supremely safe. In fact, he's flooded with light. Jesus said in John chapter 11, he who believes or trusts into me shall never die. Uh, what does he mean? It means what he says. Um, when Paul spoke of the persons who had died in Thessalonica, do you remember he's writing and he says that um, we sorrow, that is we who have lost loved ones, we sorrow. Oh yeah, this isn't some iron-clad thing where you don't weep and you don't feel it. No, you sorrow. Someone has left. There's an empty place at the table. Oh, yes, we sorrow. But then he says, but not as others. We don't sorrow like the world does. We do not sorrow as others who have no hope. Jesus has injected hope into the equation which means we sorrow, but not with sackcloth and ashes. That's a hopeless sorrow. Not saying, you know, woe is me and all the rest of it. No. We sorrow. We might sorrow very deeply, but there is triumph. There's a sparkle of resurrection in our tears. We, we, we know this isn't death as Old Testament death. Jesus went inside death. And then he says, I am he who lives. Well, that kills death. And Jesus walked out of death and with him walked out a whole human race. He's the last Adam and he brought out the first one. So that means if Adam came out in the last Adam, then everybody came out. He brings us out. And for us, this side of that, then, as I say, death is not the same. He's, con he's got the keys of death. So it's not some terrible place that I cower from. Jesus says, I have the keys of that place. Therefore, I go in, I go out. He's perfectly home inside. It's the old he says, and of Hades. Now, of course, your Old Testament, uh, your version's a bit older than mine, maybe might translate that as hell. Well, that, that's, uh, actually, that's a jolly good word if you lived in England in the ninth century, but you don't. So you've had to make up meanings to that word. Well, I don't care about your meaning. The word Hades, which is the Greek word, means no seeing. It means a place of intense darkness and I can't see can't see. And hell in ninth century English, which of course was just before our translation of the Bible into English, so they use the word, but hell meant to cover over. That's why we call it a hell net. It covers your head. And so it's the same thing, into the grave, covered over a place of darkness. But as I say, we've made up all our own definitions to it, or religion has. 
but it doesn't matter. Really, it doesn't matter. Whatever you think hell is, or whether you see it, in my opinion, according to the words used more biblically, the place of where I'm blind and I'm dark and I don't know what's going on and I've invented my own terrors inside of my darkness. But whatever, it doesn't matter. I don't care what you believe about hell. Jesus said, I have the keys of hell. I thought hell belonged to the devil. That's what the chick track said, didn't they? That they made, you know, a horned devil with a pitchfork in flames and that's his territory. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It says Jesus has the keys of hell. Come on. Jesus has the keys of hell. Meaning, I went into death. I went into the place of intense darkness and whatever you want to think about hell, whatever it is, I, I got the keys. I own it. Well, if he owns it, love owns it. And let's bring it right into now, which is much more to the point. I, I think everybody could point to a time in their life or a time now in their life and call it hell. When, when people preach, you know, when I was in New York City and I worked on the streets of New York City a lot, went into some of the darkest. <laughs> you want to talk about hell? I, I'll take you where. A young girl has not left her apartment, nor will, because she'll be raped a thousand times in the elevator day and night. Uh, I'll show you hell, where women are beaten almost to a pulp by their drunken husbands. Hell. Then in some uptown church, they say, you're dying, go to hell. Come with me, friend. <laughs> I've got people already there. Don't tell them they're going to hell. But you see, Jesus has the keys of hell. Which means, I can tell those women, I can tell those broken persons, that Jesus is right in the middle of their hell. He's perfectly at home there. Because he came into hell and said, I give you my beauty, I'll take your ashes. Jesus took to himself all our grief, our sorrow, and whatever we might want to call hell, he took it. He assumed it. Took the ashes of humanity. He gave us the beauty of his love. And that beautiful love is brought into us through the Holy Spirit. No, I'll rephrase that. It's realized in us in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is wild. Well, what does it look like? Hmm. It looks like joy, and it looks like crazy joy. And I mean that. I'm not. Listen to this. The ransom of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion which is the uh, Old Testament shorthand for the people of God. Joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads, where we used to put the ashes. The place of our identity is now everlasting joy. Everlasting Again, it's the word unto the ages, age upon age. So it means, see, happiness is for the moment. You're happy. Because all the chances, or old English haps, of your life are working toward you, for you. So you are happy. And of course, that changes very quickly. And then you wish they wouldn't hap. And so you unhap. And you're unhappy. It's a terrible thing. Happiness is a terrible thing. I was saved from happiness when I met you. Saved from happiness. Because with all happiness, there's a whole 
garbage truck full of unhappiness. Happiness, it's like, it's like a sandwich. It's got pain for the first slice of bread. Because the pain says, I'm not happy and I want to be happy. And then you get a slice of ham and say, you're happy, you're happy. And then immediately another slice of pain. And there you have a pain sandwich because that's what happiness is. It's squashed between unhappinesses. And, um, but everlasting means it's from age to age. There's no negative thing can happen to stop it. It's a joy that arises and finds its roots in the love of God. It's part of the beauty. So that is it's on our heads. Joy upon our heads. They will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Terrified. Can't stand it. Run for their lives. What is that? Psalm 30, verse 11, right on. He says, you have turned for me my mourning, that is my sackcloth and ashes, the mourning, into dancing. That sounds even irregular. Seriously. You have loosed my sackcloth, and you have clothed me with gladness so that my soul may sing praise to you and not be silent. This is a theme. This isn't just the one verse there. The beauty is for ashes, clothed with joy, and it's age long, as I say. It's age long. It's, um, I tell you what, we dance. The beauty is that we dance on the ashes of our past. And, and all the mini deaths and everything, and we can dance on them because into the ashes he's joined them. And we now live in those times in, in the strength of him. And um, it, it means that beauty, beauty slash joy, is a divine ability to release into our world of ashes. In our world of grief and sorrow and self-loathing, the, the unworthiness, the fear, anxiety, we, we release into that an energy that cancels it out. It's the energy of divine resurrection life that's realized in us. Um, and of course, it transforms all our behavior. We don't go around killing people. We don't go around destroying property. But well, that's because at one end of the scale. But at the other end, it takes away all our meanness. It takes away all of our self-centeredness. We, we have the beauty. That beauty of love is now in us. For he who is love is our life. And, and so... In Psalm 90, 17, he says, Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Meaning, the beauty of God is going to change the way you live. The beauty of God is going to change the way you work. Yeah, that, that's, that's the gospel. Jesus meets us in our ashes. Not when we found our way out. Not when we finally got a formula that works. <laughs> he meets us in our ashes. And he's got the keys of Hades. So, so you see, okay, on the road to Emmaus, that was despair. There's got plenty sackcloth and ashes on the road to Emmaus. We had hope. Talking about death of a dream. You know, get it? So what happened? Jesus comes and meets them on the road of despair. And their ashes turn into joy. Or he meets us in the garden of death and shows us it is no more. It's a garden of life. Remember? Mary Magdalene was in the garden. Well, it was a, it was a tomb. 
there. So, well, yeah, it's a garden of death. So there's no other way of putting it. And so she's weeping. What else do you do in a garden? What else? You'll find people in the cemetery you're expecting to be weeping. It's a garden of death. And Jesus comes and he asks the strangest question. He says, why are you weeping? <laughs> she hadn't got the memo that it's no longer a garden of death. It's a garden where Jesus rose from the dead. And um, it's a garden of life, and promise of life. If you're a sheep that's lost, well, he's inside your wilderness. You meet him there. You don't go looking for him. You've got to seek the Lord. The only reason you can ever seek the Lord is that he sought you first and did a jolly good job. He found you. Now maybe you can say, I'll seek you. It's a bit late, but you, yeah, you know, he seeks you. He finds you. He meets you in the wilderness. Please understand this. We've got this idea we have to do all the grunge work. We've got to get our act together. We've got to believe right. We've got to repent right. We've got to pray right. And then perhaps, maybe, that's religion. Religion already has said to everybody, this is a nice lecture, but um, it's not for you. It's not for you. And don't even think it could be for you. It's for much better people already well on their way. And even if, even if we could think of saying it was for you, it's not yet, that's for sure. You've got a long way to go. That's really, I hear that preached, that, that's that staple diet on Christian television. You've got to run through the hoops. You've got to, no, I, I'm in the ashes. I'm weeping in the garden. I'm in despair. I'm lost as a goat in a forest. And he comes to me and reveals himself to me. And what's he reveal? I have a gift. You can't earn it. There's no formula to arrive. It's a gift. And it's an exchange gift. And the exchange has already taken place, but I, I just want you to wake up to it. It's your ashes. I give you my beauty. Yeah. I like it. He, he went into the death chamber of uh, Jairus' daughter. Remember that? Do you remember the first thing you did? He threw out the professional whalers. I don't know if you remember that, but all those, they, they were professionals and they're, they're having a jolly good time whaling. And he comes in and he refuses to allow. I mean, this is gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He, he's turning the house out. Get out of here. All this wailing over ashes and dust. And then he turns and says to little child, get up. It's time to wake up. That's Jesus. That's the Jesus who is right now. And we realize him. We wake up to him. We never again ask him to do something. He's, I realize he's done. He stands there. No wonder John fell on his face. He stands there. I am the living one. I'm the first. I'm the last. I've got this whole thing together in myself. Then, uh, you mean I don't have to beg you and plead, oh, help me to get there. I'm trying to get to beauty. No, no, no. Flush that down the toilet. He's here. He's now. He is. It's done. The beauty is. We don't ask God to please do something. Please help me. But sit back in wonder. It's done. Listen, he said, I was dead. I've been in the very belly of this thing. But here I am. Behold, I am alive. And that to the ages of ages, nothing can stop it. And he's in you and he's in me. It's taken place. We is that verse. He has given us the beauty. We gave him the ashes. It is so. And so we get up in the morning and our first thought is, in Christ, Christ in me, I am this day the beauty of God. I am the love of God, the empowering joy. I am that. And I am a lover 
and a joy giver, radiant giving of peace of God. I bring beauty this day to all of life. Well, that's a far cry from sackcloth, ashes, and dust in your hair, and woe is me, and oh God help me, um, another day. No, that's all long gone, buried with Jesus. He's the resurrected beauty who gives himself to you. And there it is. And amen. And amen. I am going to bless because we, we have a webinar people here too, I do believe. And so now the blessing of God who is almighty love, who is the beauty for our ashes, that he this day shall open the eyes of your understanding, flood you with divine light, and cause you to live in the wild joy of beauty on your head. So I bless you. That is the way it is.